All right, so we're in the book of John, of course, like we've been for a while now. We're getting towards the end, we're chapter 18 out of 21. But it's been a great, a great book. And next week, I'm going to do a special side story about a man named Peter. We're going to hear about Peter today in this chapter. But next week, the whole sermon is going to be about Peter. Kind of chase down that rabbit hole a little bit. Peter is mentioned 179 times. 179 times in the New Testament. 300 page book. It was very important. We like Peter because he reminds us of ourselves. So flawed. So wrong. Almost every time Peter spoke up, Jesus is like, no, no, you're missing the point. You're not getting it. Once he looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Oh boy. I would not want to hear that from Jesus Christ. That I'm so ignorant, stupid, foolish that he refers to me as Satan. But Peter was that kind of guy. But boy, did Jesus love Peter and builds his church, starting with Peter. So we're going to learn all about that next week. It's going to be a great, great. This week, just have to have to bear with me. <laughs> we're on chapter 18. I got my bifocals today. See how that works. So we've seen Jesus predicting his own death, his own arrest. And the disciples are like, no, no, it's not going to happen. That's not going to happen to you, Jesus. But it did, it did happen. And today's chapter 18 is where the doo-doo hits the fan. And it starts to happen. Remember last week, Jesus talked about his arrest, his upcoming arrest and torture and death as a glorification. That's how he was going to be glorified. And that's how he was going to glorify God. What faith Jesus had. What a positive attitude Jesus had. No matter what was coming his way. Remember that last prayer we studied last week. Where Jesus didn't pray for himself. But he prayed for his people. He prayed for his disciples. He was thinking about you and me. When he went to that cross. So let's see what happened. With Jesus in chapter 18. The book of John. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across a brook called Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now a garden represents paradise. Remember the story of Adam and Eve? They lived in a garden. And the word paradise literally means garden. It's a Persian word. So here they are in a garden, perfect place, a place where they're close to God, a place where they're living and walking with God. Remember in the garden how God would come down to Adam and walk with him in the evening, in the cool of the evening. So God walks with us when we're in that garden. I, I, I've ever seen that sign in front of someone's house that says, no one's closer to God than when they're gardening, something like that. So. It's a beautiful place to be. But it didn't stay beautiful for long. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. For Jesus, Jesus often met with his disciples there. It's nice that we have a beautiful restaurant to meet at and a beautiful roof over our heads. Amen. But Jesus and disciples, they would often meet in a garden. These people that have these big church buildings that's okay, you know, you know, maybe God will give us one someday, who knows, who cares. But it's not what it's all about. Jesus' disciples met in a garden. And you know, further on in the Bible, in the book of Acts, there's a bunch of ladies that were meeting for Bible study on the banks of a river. Literally it says they met on the riverside to study the Word of God. So, you know, being here is well supported by the Word of God. It's a beautiful place to be. So Judas, Judas having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees went with lanterns and torches and weapons. Now we all know Judas was one of Jesus' disciples. One of the 12 innermost that Jesus had personally chosen. Now why would Jesus personally choose a person who was going to betray him? 
You know, sometimes when we see things happen, we don't understand that God has got a plan. That God is in charge of this world. And he's told us, you know, in the Bible, he's told us what's coming. And it's going to come just like Jesus said. Just like the scriptures say, it's going to happen. Some of it will seem unpleasant at times to us. But it's all part of God's plan. So Jesus had this disciple named Judas. He was the treasurer for the band of disciples. He collected the money. See, even Jesus received donations. Jesus received offerings to help support his ministry and the work they were doing. But you know what Judas would do sometimes? He would steal. He was skimming money off the top. So hopefully that won't happen here. When you give your offerings today, if someone comes up at the end and grabbing the money out of there, well, if they do, that's okay. If they need it, that's all right, too. You can always take money out of the offering if you need it. You have my permission. That's not a problem. So he procured a band of soldiers, some officers from the chief priest, and the Pharisees. Now, the soldiers probably were not Roman soldiers. At this point, the Romans, who were the ones who actually executed Jesus, and the ones who tortured Jesus, they were not involved in this at this point. This was the religious leaders that were trying to get Jesus. And so they had, the soldiers were probably the soldiers of the temple. They had temple guards at the temple because during holidays thousands, tens of thousands of people would come to Jerusalem and they had their own police force there at the temple that worked for the temple and for the priests. And that's probably what these soldiers were, not Roman soldiers. You know, I told my wife today, my wife's Italian. I said, you know who killed Jesus? It was the damn Italians. <laughs> people like to blame Jews, but it wasn't the Jews that killed Jesus. So we don't want to be anti-Semitic. We also don't want to be anti-Italian. We love our Italian brothers and sisters. They brought us spaghetti and pizza. <laughs> Can't beat it. It's nice cars. All right, so here comes Judas now. He's assembled a group of people. He's got the religious leaders. He's got the priests. He's got the Pharisees. He's got everybody there. And they have lanterns to light the the ground they're walking on and they got torches to light the air and they got weapons so well, that's a pretty opposing group of people people show up with all that in the modern day we say they show up with flash guns flashlights flashlights and pistols right so it's scary very scary so this is kind of funny. They brought Judas because Judas was going to identify who Jesus was with a kiss. You remember that? So what happens? Then Jesus, now I like this, knowing all that would happen to him. We, are in, we know that from past scriptures in this book of John. That Jesus knew what was coming. Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? Would you be so bold? They're after you with lanterns and torches and guns and flashlights. And would you step out knowing that they're looking for you and say, hey, who are you looking for? What a brave man Jesus was. He was so courageous. His faith in God was so strong. He was willing to put himself right out there. He came forward and said to them, whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was where Jesus grew up. That's why they call him Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. And incidentally, Nazareth was on a hill overlooking the valley of Armageddon, where the final war will be fought against the evil forces at the end of time. That's where Jesus grew up. He could have every day walked to the edge of the ridge where he lived and just looked down over the valley of Armageddon and picture the, the war that was coming at the end of time. They said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am he. Remember we talked about Jesus saying, I am. And that was a reference to the, the burning bush in the book of Exodus chapter 3. Where Moses came to the burning bush and said, who are you? Who, who are you that's giving me these instructions? 
And the, the voice in the burning bush said, I am has sent you. I am. So, G so Jesus in the book of John over and over said, I am the bread of life. I am the living water. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And now he just says, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with him. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and they fell to the ground. You know what it's like to stand in the presence of Almighty God? Almighty God who has the power to kill, to give life, to take life. Almighty God who can conquer all his enemies with the snap of his fingers. I think what Jesus was showing these people was this. I'm going on my own free will here. When they stood up and came towards him and he said, I am he, they fell back down onto the ground. The power of God was so strong, it just knocked them all down on the ground. They must have looked like fools with their lanterns and their torches and their swords. And Jesus' power was so strong, he could just look at them and bam, they're on the ground. Jesus was telling us something here. He's telling us that he is going to the cross willingly. He's being arrested and bound willingly. He had the power to stop it. I know when I was young, my dad used to sing a song. My dad was a great gospel singer. And he sang a song called 10,000. Ten thousand angels, and the theme of theme of the song was that Jesus, hanging on the cross, he could have called ten thousand angels to take him down, conquer his enemies, but he, he did not. Jesus said, "My kingdom is not of this world," and he wanted people to understand that. So they drew back and fell to the ground, and so they started getting up. And Jesus asked them again, "Whom do you seek?" And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I told you that I am he. If you seek me, let these other men go. Once again, he's thinking about his disciples. If you seek me, let these others go. This was to fill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have not lost one. Then Simon Peter, here he is, Simon Peter, never gets things right always gets things wrong. It's so funny in a way. But Simon Peter pulls out a sword and he drew it and he struck the high priest's servant and he cut off his right ear. Simon Peter draws out a sword. He's going to fight for Jesus. That's not what Jesus wanted him to do. Jesus never in the Bible calls Christians to form an army and get weapons and attack the evil people. Jesus is going to take care of that at the end of time. Jesus told a parable. He says they are growing wheat, a field of wheat, to, give, to make some profit and have some food. And, and some people came along and started throwing in weeds, weeds among the wheat. These represent evil people that are in there to do damage to the church, to the true Christians. And they said, they were saying, what should we do? Should we go through and pluck out all the weeds? And Jesus said, no, don't pluck out the weeds. I'm going to take care of that when I come back at the end of time. Jesus is going to take care of all that. You know, he's going to come back with an army of angels. But here's the funny thing. Even the angels aren't going to be fighting the war or the battle. Jesus himself is going to fight the war and the battle. And he has a sword that comes out of his mouth. And he slays all these sinners. There's never a time where the Bible tells Christians, weaponize, arm up, hurt or kill the evil people. Jesus is about peace and about love to all people. So if you hear people in the name of Christ weaponizing and trying to hurt people, that is not of the Lord ever. That's not of the Lord. But Simon Peter didn't understand that. He struck the servant's right ear and he cut, up, cut it off. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captains and their officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Now, I don't know if you've ever, ever been arrested. I'm sure some people here have. I, it's hard to imagine what it's like to me, somebody that's 
like a police officer to come and put handcuffs on you and haul you away and lock you up. What an awful thing to go through. And it's what Jesus went through. They arrested him and they bound him. I'm sure they at least tied his hands up behind his back. I, I don't know what else they did. They may have tied him up even more. But they, they made him helpless. They made it seem like he was helpless. And he willingly let this happen. He didn't have to go through this humiliation and this loss of freedom like he did. They bound him. First they led him to Annas. No jokes, please. For he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. So they brought him to Annas. He's the father-in-law of the high priest. So there's a good old boy network going here. People related through marriage, and they have great power. And that's where he went first, Annas. Now, it was Annas who advised the Jews that it would be better for one man should die for the people. Now, when Caiaphas said that it'd be, well, actually said it's expedience that one man die for the people, he didn't know he was talking about Jesus Christ dying for the people's sins. He was talking about if there's a rabble rouser causing problems, like Jesus, put him to death before the Romans come down here and kill everybody. And he said it's expedient that one man die for the people. So he was willing to let Jesus die before the Romans came in and killed everybody. But he didn't realize how true what he was saying was, that one man would die for all the people. And we're so thankful today that Jesus died for us, for our sins, to bring our forgiveness and to live in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So that's Annas and his, his son-in-law, Caiaphas. So these are not really fair trials, are they? This is at night happening. I mean, the courts weren't even open. This is late at night. And they're bringing him before these people to get him judged and condemned. The Jews weren't allowed to crucify anybody. The religious leaders didn't have the power or authority to crucify. Crucifixion was generally held as a punishment for insurrection and for people that were trying to fight against the Roman government. So they couldn't do it, but they wanted to convince the Romans to do it for them. Now Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. The other disciple was probably John, but we don't know for sure. Since that other disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. So this one that had the hookups and connections that knew the high priest, he goes on into the courtyard to see what's happening with Jesus. And then he went and told the servant girl, here, let my buddy Peter in. So she did. But then she sees Peter. She says, are you, also, are you not one of his man's disciples? She kind of recognized Peter. Aren't you one of Jesus' disciples too? What would you say if someone asked you, are you a disciple of Jesus? What would you say if the police came and because I have the microphone, they arrested me? draw me away, and then came back here and said, who else is a follower of Jesus here today? Would you be willing to suffer that kind of fate? Was your faith that strong? Are you also not one of the man's disciples? And Peter said, I am not. I am not. See how Jesus just said, I am he. And Peter says the negative. I am not one of this man's disciples. What an awful thing to say. You remember a few chapters earlier when Jesus was talking about what was going to happen? And Peter said, I will go with you. I will follow you to the cross. I will die with you. I will never leave you alone. I will die with you. And now he's standing there to a servant girl that's watching the door to the courtyard saying, I don't know this guy. I'm not one of his disciples. Boy, we're so much like Peter sometimes. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. And they were standing and warming themselves. 
Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. So now he's inside the courtyard, and he's standing there warming himself on the fire with everybody else. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and teachings. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. So they're just questioning him about what he's teaching. Did you know if you taught the wrong thing in those days, they'd call it blasphemy and the punishment was to be stoned to death? So that's why they're questioning Jesus. They want to catch him. They want to get him. They want to stone him. They were questioning him about his disciples and his teachings. Okay? Jesus said, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught publicly. I put that word in. I have always taught publicly in synagogues and in the temples where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. And when Jesus said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, is that how you answer the high priest? They accused Jesus of being insubordinate and snappy, sarcastic with the high priest. Whoa, the high priest was such a big man, so important. But here was standing the son of God, son of God, God in the flesh. And they didn't understand that. And they slap him in the face, bam. How can you disrespect the high priest? Who do you think you are? And Jesus just took it. Man, we want people to think how important we are. We want people to think how powerful we are. We don't want to take it. We want to strike back. We've got to learn from the example of Jesus. That's not the way of Jesus. You know, I listen to Christian radio this week. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I don't like a lot of the Christian songs particularly. But once in a while I hear a song, and I'm like, that, 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 yeah, I believe that. That is a good song. And I saw one this week called The Jesus Way. And the guy was singing, I'm going to do things the Jesus way. And he talked about forgiveness. He talked about love. He talked about taking care of other people. He talked about the things that Jesus actually taught. So many times we hear Christian information and it's nothing to do with what Jesus taught. We've got to be careful not to get caught up in that. We've got to live the Jesus way. We've got to read the scriptures and see what Jesus said. And we've got to do those things, even though they're difficult. And they go against our human nature and they go against our society. We've got to live the Jesus way. And that's what Jesus was doing. He was living the right way. He, was struck, he struck Jesus with his hand. And he said, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus said to him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then just sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So he had a little, kind of a little fake trial there, trying to get him condemned to death at night. Now he's sending him to Caiaphas, the son-in-law of Annas, for another fake trial. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, as we mentioned earlier. So they said to him, you are, you also are not one of the disciples, are you? Jesus, no, uh, Peter denied it. And Peter said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? So this guy was related to the guy that had his ear cut off. And of course, Jesus healed him immediately and told Peter to put his sword away. And this guy saying, didn't I see you? Apparently this guy was part of the mob that went to arrest Jesus. Did I see you? You were the guy with that sword. You cut my cousin's ear off. I'm sure it was you. Peter's like, nope, not me. And then you heard this sound. <laughs> that was an amen, brother. I'm just, this little dog's getting restless now, too. 
Jesus had told Peter, after Jesus, after Peter had sworn his allegiance to the death to Jesus, Jesus had told Peter a day earlier, you're going to deny me three times before the cock grows. Jesus told him it was going to happen. And when that cock crowed, boy, was Peter sad. He let his best friend down. He let his Messiah down. Man. Okay, calm down. There's not any real research here. There is sometimes, but not today. So, all right. The Peru Rooster Crow. I think I'm going to stop there because I don't want to go too long. So I know you guys get the whole life to live. And I, I do hope, I say this a lot, but I do hope you guys are reading your Bible. How do you expect to grow and get to know the Lord? How do you, how do you expect to live the Jesus way if you're not reading what he taught us? It's just common sense. You need to keep that Bible open and read it, study it. You know, it's okay to watch a video of a preacher, but it's a lot better to get into the Word of God for yourself. Now today, I want to invite people to come up here and pray with me. Some of you may have never have known Christ. Some of you may have never given your life to Christ. And if that's your case, I want you to come up here and pray with me. And we're going to invite Jesus Christ into your heart today. You know, we receive some wonderful gifts from the Lord. We receive the gift of eternal life. We receive forgiveness of all our sins. And we receive the power of the Holy Spirit, who dwells in our hearts and gives us the strength to live the Jesus way. Some of you, someone here might have a special prayer question need. Or maybe someone today heard the sermon and realized, I'm a lot like Peter. I need to be stronger. I need to take risk. I need to be brave like Jesus. Whatever the need is, I'm going to invite you to come up and pray with me right now.